Well, that was fun, wasn't it? What a great way to start. Uh, what a great way to start an event. So thank you for your patience and apologies for um, that little fire alarm that went off. But thank you for sticking around. You're in for a great event tonight. My name is Janet Weber. I'm the executive director of SFU Public Square, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to our event tonight. Uh, and also, hopefully, there's still people watching online. We are live webcasting on Facebook on our YouTube channel, and also the Vancouver Sun is live streaming our event this evening. So welcome to everyone joining us online. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are gathered here this evening on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I think if we could just take a moment and reflect on the great privilege it is that we are all able to be here to live, work, and play on these lands, and maybe take a moment to think about how we might uh, work towards uh, supporting Indigenous self-determination in Canada, in our daily lives, in our work, in our volunteering, how we vote. Um, for those of you that don't know, SFU Public Square is a community engagement initiative of Simon Fraser University. We are supporting the university's mission to be Canada's engaged university. We do that by doing events and activities such as this, and we do that by building social infrastructure, we encourage civic participation, we uh, encourage folks to come together and exchange knowledge, mobilize knowledge, and co-create solutions for our pressing social issues. We'd like to thank our event co-producer this evening. Shout out to the Van City Office of Community Engagement for providing us with this fantastic venue this evening. And um, I just wanted to just say that SFU Public Square doesn't usually do debate. This is really our very first time ever doing an Oxford style debate. So we're super excited to see how tonight goes. And um, we felt like for this particular topic and in this current moment in time where we're finding ourselves in increased moments of polarization, we're finding a, an erosion of our civil discourse, we're finding a fragmentation of our media landscape. We heard from so many people about the difficulty of being able to find some unbiased information to help them make their decision about how they wanted to vote in this uh, referendum. So tonight we have two goals. One, to help you make your decision uh, of how you want to vote in the referendum, and two, to model uh, civil discourse. We are going to have four fantastic debaters up here tonight who are going to be di in disagreement with each other, but will be in conversation in a way that is respectful. It will, will not result in name calling, personal attacks, or any other bad behavior. I, I'm pretty sure that's the way things are gonna go. Um, and now, <laughs> Uh, now I'd like to just introduce Micah Goldberg. Michael is a lawyer here in Vancouver, and he actually came to SFU with the idea of doing this Oxford-style debate. He helped us arrange to have our debaters here with us this evening, and uh, he's really the impetus for the idea, so I'd like to call Micah to come on up. Thanks, Janet. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing? Good, in from the cold, massive respect for all of you for sticking with us, so thank you very much. I hope you're all ready to politely listen to civil discourse tonight, as I am, uh, so welcome. Um, uh, we sold out of tickets tonight, and I think that that reveals a voracious appetite for events like this. Uh, to those of you who are still watching on the live stream, welcome, it's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Uh, I'm going to introduce our fantastic moderator in just one moment, uh, but before I'd like to ask the crowd by a show of hands, how many of you were able to watch the Horgan Wilkinson debate earlier this month? Okay, so quite a few of you. And I'm not sure if you feel the same way that I do, but uh, in the midst of this heated, lively debate where both leaders got their shots in, I, I was sort of left wanting. Uh, it seemed like there was more on the line for these two individuals than the merits of proportional representation. The way the leaders bickered and spoke over each other felt like they weren't listening, like there was something personal on the line, like there was an ulterior motive uh, for staking out their respective decisions. And it left something to be desired, as debates with politicians so often do. Um, so it left me wondering, can we have a clash of ideas between intelligent people on contentious matters and still have that discourse remain respectful. 
And I had found one example of that in probably the last place I should seek respectful discourse, Twitter. Uh, I read a brilliant exchange between two of my favorite interlocutors on the merits of proportional representation, but in a civil way, in a meaningful way. And I wanted to know whether we could take that debate to an audience of potential voters. So I went to Vancouver's premier catalyst on pressing public issues, SFU Public Square, and I talked to Janet Weber, and uh, Janet agreed that this event had the capacity to raise the level of intelligent discussion we have both in this province and in this city, and uh, the capacity to raise the level of intelligent discussion in the public square. And as Janet mentioned, this debate has two functions. On the one hand, this debate offers an opportunity for a respectful clash of ideas between supremely qualified debaters on whether or not we should change our electoral system in British Columbia, and the other function is to restore critical thinking and civility to our public conversations, not just in this room, but across our province. Can we move away from an outrage culture and personal attacks and towards civil discussions, mutual respect and understanding our fellow citizens, our peers, our coworkers, our friends? That is the impetus behind tonight. And now that I've laid down the gauntlet, uh, let's meet our moderator, Nancy Olweiler. Nancy has her PhD from UBC in economics, and she presently serves as the director and professor in SFU's School of Public Policy. Please join me in welcoming Nancy Olweiler. Thank you, Micah. Thank you, Janet. Thank you all for sticking around. I was freezing out there and wanted to bail out. Uh, but I saw some of my students and they said, no, you can't go. <laughs> so uh, again, thank you. This is a really exciting event. I'm delighted to see all of you here. And I'm just going to give you a very short, for those of you who have not been in British Columbia and know how much we love referenda and how successful they've been, uh, not just in uh, dealing with uh, proportional representation, but other things like transit referenda and, you know, good stuff like that. But, you know, the, the good news is it does allow the people to speak, and you are the people, and you are here to, to learn and to express your own views. So, of course, we encourage you to vote, not only here, but in the, in the real referendum. So, of course, we had in 2004, the Liberal government at that time fulfilled its election promise made in 2001 to start thinking about uh, proportional representation, and that was the formation of the Citizens' Assembly, bringing 161 citizens together who spent a lot of time learning about electoral systems, getting lectures from professors, really reading through it, and came up with, of course, the uh, single transferable vote system, which is the one after their deliberations that they decided to bring to the vote. Uh, lots of time and effort explaining that to the citizens of British Columbia, and 57% of the voters did vote in favor of it. There was a threshold of 60% supermajority, and thus it failed. 2009 tried again. 60% uh, of the people voted to keep the first-past-the-post system. So one of the things to think about tonight as our debaters go forth is why the change? What, what is going on and, and, and how is it affecting us this time, for those of us that can remember that? So here we are again, fulfilling a campaign promise of the current government, and let's see what happens is the third time the charm. So tonight, the format, as been suggested to you, is an official debate. We have two teams of outstanding debaters, as both Janet and Mika have said. They will argue both for and against the resolution, which reads, proportional representation that best reflects the will of the people. Proportional representation best reflects the will of the people. Uh, they will be focused on the resolution at hand. They will be debating the merits of the resolution. And this is all in terms of the will of the electorate, us, the people of British Columbia. As uh, both Janet and Meek have said, there will be no standing up and talking behind the person who's giving their discussion. Uh, everyone is going to be extremely well behaved. And they've also made an initial concession. 
Uh, those of you that have been following the issues here know that there are some features of the current referendum that one might use against the opposition. And both the for and against have decided the following. The for side will not be relying on the existence of the two election cycle escape clause uh, to make their arguments. And the against side will not dwell on the uncertainty of each of the proposed forms of the, the pro rep in the arguments. Now, these are not trivial things. We are not meaning to trivialize them, but we're going to focus on the resolution at hand, the will of the people. The debate will have three rounds, and then you, our audience, will uh, decide the winner. I will talk about how the voting goes. Round one is opening statements prepared by both the pro, the, whichever side they're on, the pro and the con side. <laughs> And uh, round two involves some questions that I'll be posing and then questions from you, the audience. So there'll be an opportunity to ask your questions. There will be, you, I'll give you the rules on that in a minute. And then round three has each debater making a closing statement before you do your final voting. So Public Square did a pre-event survey. You saw it when, uh, when you were coming in about the overall voting. But 38% of those at the pre-event said that you have already decided your vote. And over half of those decided votes said that you're open to changing your mind. So that's exactly the spirit of a debate, to see if you're open to changing your mind and what happens. So how do you vote? When you checked in, did everybody vote? Yeah. OK, nobody needs a ballot. Anybody need a ballot? Raise your hand. You had plenty of time out in the rain uh, to, to vote for it. So you should have had two ballots. You've already handed in the first. And the other one will be handed in at the end. There will have people running up and down the aisles collecting them for you. Um, and uh, then we're going to see what happens. So the side that wins is the side that changes most people's, the, the most minds. It's not who voted the most votes for, for or against. It's how did the debate affect your vote. That is what the debating winner is going to be. Now let's welcome our debaters. Do you want to come up to the stage? <laughs> on my left, arguing for the motion, on my far left is, uh, oh no, it's on my right. I keep wanting to get the right and the left mixed up, and that has nothing to do with for and against. Uh, Stuart, I keep, uh, Stuart's on my right. Stuart teaches international studies and history at SFU and serves as the president of the Los Altos Institute. Institute. Stewart has been a stalwart in campaigns for proportional representation, so working since 1994 as the director of Fair Vote Canada, Fair Vote BC, Fair Vote Ontario. There's a lot of fair voting trying to go on here. <laughs> Movement for Voter Equality and the Toronto Democracy Initiative. He was leader of the BC Green Party, but he is no longer affiliated with a provincial party. Next to Stewart, is Chuka Ajekum. Chuka is a graduate student in political science at UBC, and his work focuses on drug policy and inequality. He holds a research position at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions at UBC, and he also does research for the Canadian Center for Policy and Alternatives. Arguing against tonight's resolution, proportional representation best reflects the will of the people, uh, is Adam Goldenberg on my left. Adam is an adjunct professor of law at the University of Toronto. Thank you for coming out here to warm up. Uh, and uh, a trial and appellate lawyer at McCarthy Tetral LLP. He served as a law clerk to the Chief Justice of Canada and to the judges of the Court of Appeal for Ontario and a chief speechwriter to the leader of the opposition in Parliament and is a senior political aide in the government of Ontario. Thanks again for, for taking the trip. Next to Adam is Aubin Calvert. Aubin holds a PhD in political science in an LLB from that other university across town. Um, and uh, her scholarship has focused on democratic theory and political communication. She practices administrative law and commercial litigation at Hunter Litigation Chambers in Vancouver. Would you want to join again in welcoming our debaters? And now we're ready to begin. Round one begins with opening statements from each debater in turn, speaking first for the motion, proportional representation best reflects 
the, inter the will of the people of British Columbia is Stuart Parker. Thank you, Stuart. Well, chances are this is not the first time you've uh, engaged with proportional representation debate in this province. You've probably heard a bunch of stuff from the yes and no sides in the media and elsewhere. My job in my opening is to clear the decks, to address the no side arguments you may be familiar with from the popular media um, so that we can move on to the specific arguments that are going to come from this room. The no side is run by very small, smart people, and so they've constructed a set of arguments that, while irrational, are good at appealing to people's emotions. Their tactic is to take things about the first-past-the-post system that are causing anger or anxiety and blame those things on proportional representation. So you might have heard from Suzanne Anton about, um, about unstable minority government coalitions. British Columbians currently live under a minority government whose stability is constantly called into question by Andrew Weaver, who threatens to bring the NDP government down every couple of months over violations of his agreement with them, both real and perceived. Furthermore, nine of the last 20 federal governments have been minorities, many of them short-lived and characterized by brinksmanship by both the prime minister and opposition parties. Stephen Harper's practices of brinksmanship led to the prorogation crisis of 2008, a full-blown constitutional crisis, and a series of other unconstructive showdowns. During this time, the government became less transparent, more dictatorial, exhausting Canadians and destabilizing our country. Campaigners like Bill Thielman sense our fatigue with short-lived and unstable minority governments. And so they imply that governments like this will be the norm under proportional representation. A big part of the reason that Canada has suffered from so many minority governments um, in the past uh, is uh, and the consequent instability is because of regional minority parties being overrepresented due to the quirks of first past the post. Religiously intolerant regional Quebec nationalist parties based in the whitest, most rural areas of the country have been consistently overrepresented by first past the post. The creditiste movement held the balance of power in our parliament from 1963 to 1968 and in 1979 and 1980. The Bloc Québécois held the balance of power from 2004 till 2011. So naturally, the no forces, um, Suzanne, Bill, and others, um, talk about how proportional representation will permit small parochial parties to hold our governments hostage with only a very small share of the vote. The thing is that in most PR systems, unlike first past the post, regional parties cannot do what the creditists and bloc did. A, win representation in Parliament with less than 5% of the vote, as the creditists did in 1965 and 1979, and as the bloc currently does in our Parliament. B, um, under PR, they can't receive a larger share of the seats than their share of the popular vote. And yet every election from 1993 to 2011, the Bloc Québécois did precisely that, getting a larger share of the seats than their share of the vote. And Canada is not the worst case of this. Many of us are looking overseas, looking at the dangerous state of the UK economy and the UK's government. Theresa May cannot successfully negotiate a Brexit deal because she's being kept in office by a former terrorist militia, the Democratic Unionist Party, which holds the balance of power in Westminster with 0.9% of the popular vote, something made possible only by first past the post. But of course, what's frightening people all over the civilized world these days is the seizure of power by far-right political movements and the creation of new authoritarian often theocratic racist regimes. 
In India, Narendra Modi, a former member of a Hindu extremist militia, has taken over the conservative BJP party and now is turning India into an increasingly intolerant authoritarian state. And of course, we don't need to look all the way to India, do we, to see something like this? <laughs> Down south, Donald Trump and the white nationalist movement have seized control of the US Republican Party and on our TVs and radios every day, making intolerant, misogynist, racist comments and enacting misogynist, racist policies. So, People like my friend Bill Thielman have decided that this is something to do with proportional representation. They think that they can use people's fear of something to which first past the post is uniquely vulnerable, i.e. the takeover of a major party by a sectarian group, and attribute that property to PR. In countries with PR, we find white nationalists and theocrats in small minority parties that major parties won't deal with. But in our system, there is always the danger that they will hold the highest office in the land. So if PR has shortcomings, let's focus on its shortcomings in this debate, not the shortcomings of the present system that some have falsely attributed to PR. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Stuart, very nicely timed. You just made it under the wire, so I didn't have to do it. So thank you. <laughs> Practice, very good. Aubin Calvert, over to you. Thank you, Madam Moderator. So I gather that many people, I'm not sure we've seen the results from when people first came in, but certainly the online polls, a majority of, of people attending this or participating in this event think that first past the post best reflects the will of the people. So despite what the majority of you seem to think, I'm here to tell you why proportional representation does not reflect the will of the people. In fact, it doesn't even try. Proportional representation systems ask us a simple question. Which party do you like the best? It spares voters the difficult task of compromising at the ballot box, of forsaking their ideological purity in order to know in advance what each contender for power will do if it forms the government. What we say the will of the people is not the aggregate of the people's ideological preferences. It is rather a collective choice about how we wish to be governed. An electoral system reflects the will of the people when it permits voters to make that choice and gives a party a mandate to carry it out. First past the post does this, proportional representation does not. To persuade you of this, Adam and I are going to break down the life of a government into three chapters, coming into office, being in office, and being kicked out of office. I will tell you how first past the post better reflects the will of the people during the first two chapters. Adam will talk about the third. So first, coming into office. First past the post forces parties to compromise before elections, not after them. So look at British Columbia's political landscape. We have a Liberal Party that's a coalition of the centre and the centre-right. We have a New Democratic Party that's a coalition of the centre and the centre-left. In a proportional representation system, the Liberals and the NDP would most likely each break into smaller parties, representing thinner gradations of the political spectrum. Centrist voters and voters on the left and right of them would no longer have to compromise and vote for one big tent party or the other. Now, none of these smaller, ideologically purer parties will ever win enough seats to govern on its own. They will have to find partners and compromise with those partners in order to take power. So let's say a party of the center and a party of the right decide to form a coalition government. Their leaders disappear into a back room. They negotiate in secret. They each compromise at least some of the priorities and values that put them there in the first place just for the sake of governing. And they emerge days or perhaps weeks later with a governing ag agreement. That's their plan for the province. Proportional representation will have just given us a center right ideologically diluted BC Liberal government without a single British Columbian ever having voted for one. This system does a bad job of capturing the will of the people. Here's why. The set of trade-offs that politicians are willing to make for a chance at governing may bear little resemblance to the trade-offs that voters would have made had they been forced to make that choice. First past the post forces the choice, and we say that's a good thing. First past the post requires different ideological factions to work out their difference differences in advance, to draft platforms that reflect compromises, and to take those platforms to the electorate before election day. Proportional representation reverses the sequence. 
Yes, it improves the odds that you will send a governing party to the legislature that is, forms a near perfect image for your personal political preferences. Yes, it spares voters with strong ideological commitments from ever having to vote for a party platform that contains compromises with which they disagree. Yes, it allows narrow gauge single issues to win seats, single issue parties to win seats. Proportional representation does all this by postponing the hard work of politics until after the election. It therefore denies voters an opportunity to choose which set of compromises they prefer, when those hard choices are the very reason that we have representative government in the first place. Proportional representation is great for self-expression. It lets voters know in clear and uncompromising terms how they wish they could be governed, but it does not let them choose how they will actually be governed. Proportional representation changes the ballot question. Instead of asking, how do you want to be governed? It says, how do you identify ideologically? And we say that the result does not reflect the will of the people. Second, being in office. We submit that the will of the people is best reflected when politicians govern with a view to obtaining the support from those who do not, who do not already agree with them. For this reason, we should be suspicious of any electoral system that rewards party, li party loyalty and ide ideological purity above all else. We say that is precisely what proportional representation is designed to do. Sure, parties in a proportional representation system can snag voters from their ideological neighbors from time to time. But they can also govern secure in their knowledge that they will never dip below a core set of seats, provided they preserve the loyalty of their base. And when the system is designed to elect significant numbers of MLAs exclusively on the basis of party affiliation, as each of the options in the referendum would, then individual politicians have a strong incentive to, to place the good of their party over the good of the province. This, we say, is no way to reflect the will of the people. First past the post is different. Under our current system, losing just a few moderates can spell disaster for a mainstream political party in, an elect, in a single election. We say this makes parties and politi politicians' behavior in government more reflective of the will of the electorate as a whole. Proportional representation, by contrast, favors the will of the party and its most committed and often most polarized supporters. No electoral system is perfect. Proportional representation and first past the post certainly both reflect sound democratic principles. Your choice this evening and in this referendum is between the trade-offs that each approach entails. And it's about where, when, and by whom in, in the process you think that the will of the people requires the work, the hard work of politics to be done. Because first past the post better reflects the will of the people and how governments come to office, and how they behave once they get there, the motion before you this evening must be defeated. We beg to oppose. Thank you, Aubin. Chuka. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I'd like to take a moment to just define specifically what we'll be discussing this evening. The motion we're meant to debate, as articulated, is that proportional rep representation best reflects the will of the people. The will of the people is, of course, a nebulous concept, making it difficult to define. But accepting that, what can we specifically say about it? Well, we can say that the motion does not claim that proportional representation, or PR, is better for democracy, at least not without an agreed upon understanding of what that would mean. While there is evidence that PR indeed does benefit levels of democratic trust and participation, this falls outside the boundary that we confront today. We can also say that the motion does not claim that PR produces better public policy, though, again, there is evidence that among OECD countries using a PR system, they outperform countries with a first-past-the-post system on several significant measures, including human development, education, and quality of life. But this also seems beyond the boundary of this evening's debate. To determine what the motion does claim, we must question the concept of the will of the people as a measure of democratic electoral systems. Often when political leaders claim to represent the will of the people, they assert a homogenous people, and so a homogenous will. But we know that democratic communities are anything but homogenous, that they contain many different peoples with many different wills. A diverse pluralistic society like ours requires an electoral system that reflects that, that pluralism. Given that we're discussing electoral systems, we can surmise that the wills of the peoples, so to speak, refers to the people's electoral wills, or their electoral preferences, and it allows that these preferences are numerous and distinct. So, I argue that the motion claims that PR better represents the public's preferences as voters, and I believe that's an important distinction. But how can we measure these preferences? Well, we're faced with two options. One, we can consider the choices that voters make on their ballot, or two, we can consider the choices that voters want to make. 
In either, in either conception, we see very quickly that first past the post fails to represent the people's wills as directly as PR does. Taking the first option, the, the choices that voters actually make, the prevalence of false and lopsided majority governments in BC show voters' actual choices are not always reflected in our electoral system in the most meaningful way. Of the 32 BC elections since 1903, more than 20 have produced false or lopsided majorities in the legislature. If you voted for a candidate that lost their riding, your vote was not meaningfully reflected in the makeup of the legislature produced by that election. This means your particular will as a voter was not visible in the legislature. And if we take the second option, the choices voters want to make, the type and amount of, of strategic voting that we see under first past the post, wherein voters are encouraged to, 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 where when voters are encouraged to vote for a candidate they don't earnestly support, simply to prevent a candidate they vigorously oppose from taking power, shows again that our system fails to represent voters' preferences as meaningfully as PR does. By sending only a single representative to parliament per riding, first past the post works to impose homogeneity on constituencies, both in that a single candidate is said to represent diverse and at times conflicting preferences, and in that you have to take these considerations into account when you're casting your vote. There's also the intuitive sense of fairness, the fundamental democratic value of political equality. Often, first past the post violates this sense of fairness. In the 2013 election in the riding of Saanich North in the Islands, Gary Holman won just over one, the riding with just over 33% of the vote, despite that his two, uh, the two opposing candidates received between 32 and 33% of the vote. And if we're considering the, the entire province, in 1996, the NDP won a majority despite losing the popular vote. And, 2000, and, and in 2001, the Liberals won 97% of the seats with 57% of the popular vote. So how meaningfully are voters' preferences reflected in these outcomes? I suspect that we will drift outside the boundaries that I've just described through the course of this debate tonight. However, on these grounds, on whether our current single-member plurality system or a proportionally representative one better serves the preferences of the public as voters and better reflects that which they value about democratic systems, I believe it is clear that PR is superior and that it would be very difficult to claim otherwise. And I do have one final note. Though the four of us are up here debating this evening, I believe that my views regarding our electoral system are no more valuable than any of yours watching. In a democratic society, our political system belongs to every single one of us. And while acknowledging the colonial foundations of this society, it is left to us today and every day to determine how we will live together. To quote the dear sister Nina Turner, who herself was bor borrowing the words, we may not all have come here on the same ship, but we in the same boat right now. <laughs> With the challenge, <laughs> With the challenges we face as a province, as a country, and indeed as a species on this planet, we need to find effective ways of working together despite our earnest differences. Proportional representation is one of those ways. Thank you. We sure are on the same boat. Thank you, Chuka. And last, uh, closing up the arguments against is Adam. Yeah, right. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you everyone for being here. Before I begin, first note, please remember that the nearest exit may be behind you in the event of an emergency. Second of all, I just want to clarify, though I am a practicing lawyer, I am speaking tonight only for myself. I am not here representing anyone. Think of me like a party list MLA under a mixed member proportional <laughs> electoral system. I grew up here in Vancouver, but as Nancy mentioned, I now practice and teach law in Toronto, where, as you know, the will of the people is currently represented by a brand new government. For many of you, I know Ontario's recent election is proof of our opponent's argument. Doug Ford's Conservatives won 61% of the seats in the legislature on just 40% of the popular vote. Now, how does that reflect the will of the people, you ask? Well, because as Dr. Calvert has already told you, it reflects the best measure of how Ontarians wish to be governed, even if it doesn't reflect how each of them identifies ideologically. Proportional representation does a good job of choosing politicians based on their ideological stripe, green, orange, red, blue, fascist. 
but it is not designed to give voters a choice between governing agendas or between the compromises that governing requires. Those choices are instead made by politicians in secret negotiations weeks or sometimes months after an election. Sweden is now three months since its last election and still without a government because those secret negotiations are ongoing. Ontario voters earlier this year were offered a choice between three more or less comprehensive visions for the province. The most voters in the most ridings chose Doug Ford's. And everyone knew on election night that the incoming government had a mandate to turn the page on 15 years of liberal government, a government that 80% of voters had just rejected. Now, imagine that Ontario had proportional representation. 40% of the legislature would be conservative, 34% would be NDP, 20% would be liberal, and 5% would be green. There'd be huge pressure on the NDP and the liberals to do a deal to keep Doug Ford out of the premier's office. Uh, the Greens would still be left out of the government because there'd be no reason to include them. Why compromise with that extra party when you don't have to? But the Liberals would still be in the government. There would be Liberals in the cabinet. And Kathleen Wynne, who was so unpopular as Premier that she conceded the election before it was over, would almost certainly be a cabinet minister. In fact, she might even still be the Premier. Because remember, in a proportional system, it's not always the leader of the largest party that gets to lead the government. Many of us would be quite happy with that result. But most Ontarians would be outraged, and justifiably so, because when 80% of voters reject a long incumbent government, it's time for a change. First Past the Post delivers that change as it did in Ontario earlier this year. Proportional representation would not. The occasional conservative government, I would submit, is a small price to pay for the power to kick the bums out, all the way out, every four years. And any system that would deny us that ability cannot possibly represent the will of the people when it matters most. But let's go back to the Ford government for another moment. I'd like to respond to a couple of points that the members opposite have made. First, this idea of wasted votes, or as Chuka put it, not everyone's will is reflected in the legislature under First Past the Post. My friends would have you believe that of the 25% of Ontarians who voted Liberal or Green earlier this year, anyone who didn't elect a Liberal or a Green representative wasted their vote. But tell that to NDP legislators who barely squeaked by their Liberal opponents and who are worried about keeping their seats next time. Tell that to Liberal candidates who lost to Conservatives because of the strength of the Green vote in their ridings. You can bet they'll be running with those Greens in mind next time. And tell it to Premier Ford's team, who have to govern in a way that protects their majority in the next election, despite all those NDP and Liberal and Green voters out there in Conservative ridings. The, who you vote for and the actual distribution of votes in a particular constituency affects how MPPs or MLAs in British Columbia do their jobs as representatives. That's simply a fact, and I speak here as someone who's worked with those legislators as a political staffer. There is no such thing as a wasted vote. Second, the alleged unfairness of a majority government taking office with less than a majority of the vote. This is what Chuka calls false majorities. Remember, every voter in Doug Ford's 40% cast their ballot not only for a local conservative candidate, but also for the incoming government's agenda. That's 40% more than would have cast their ballot for a coalition government's agenda if such a government had been formed through secret negotiations in a proportional system. Remember, proportional representation does not make proportional government. Someone is still in government and someone is still in the opposition. And that government still has to make choices about how to govern. In Germany, after the 2005 election, under proportional representation, a coalition was formed between the two major parties, which collectively represented the will so-called, of 70% of the electorate, 70%. But when you went back out into the field as a pollster after that election, after that government was formed, less than 30% of people liked the fact that they were now governed by this grand coalition. So simply looking at the distribution of votes on election night and doing that math and saying, well, a coalition that represents those voters must surely then be more legitimate is not borne out in reality. No one votes for a coalition and no voters are included in the choices that will shape its agenda. In other words, the governments govern according to the will of the politicians, not the people. So if you, agree, if you agree with me that the will of the people requires not just polling ideology, but rather choosing between the compromises that reflect how we will be, how we will be governed, 
if you want to reward politicians not for party loyalty, but for offering moderate proposals that appeal to a broad spectrum of citizens, and if you, like me, believe that the will of the people is never more important than when it's time to show your government the door, then the electoral system for you is the one we already have. For all these reasons, Madam Speaker, we beg to oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. There, there we have it. That is the end of round one of the debate. And I am now waiting for the vote uh, that you came in with. OK, here's, here's the envelope. So pretty much like uh, you saw the, the numbers that were up on the screen when we began, four, 62% against 12%, and the great undecided, 26%. So that is what you're up against, folks. Big advantage to the uh, four side, except they have the most to lose if any of you change your vote. And big opportunity for the uh, against side. So now we're gonna to move to round two. Uh, as you register tonight, you should have a pen and a card if you didn't lose it outside trying to light a fire to have a, a real fire instead of whatever else was going on. Um, you should have that and your chance is to write a question. Uh, you will have opportunity to do that because I'm gonna ask the, the, the two sides some questions now. We'll have a prompt on the screen for when it's time for you to pass your questions to the aisle where one of our friendly volunteers will come and pick it up from you. Uh, don't do it beforehand, don't drop it. They will pick it up and uh, they will uh, then collate those and bring them up front to do it. So please be aware of what's going on behind you. Don't get so wrapped up that you forget to hand your questions in. And for those of you watching online, please ask your questions via, via the Slido link? Slido. Slido. What is that? OK. <laughs> Don't, it's too high tech, Nancy. Just shut up and keep moving. Um, they know what to do. You know what to do. OK, you know what to do. OK, quick recap. Quick, quick recap. I'm going to summarize just very briefly some of the points that we heard tonight. Uh, and just so that we can start off the, the round two with uh, some, some things to focus on. For the four side, we heard the diverse, pluralistic society requires an electoral system that reflects that pure, pure, what, purism, pluralism, hard word for an economist. Uh, democratic value holds that votes cast in an election should impact the outcome. Therefore, wasted votes fail to meet this value. There needs to be an increase in efforts to educate and empower people to have the time and energy to vote and to pursue their political interests. And proportional representation is one of those factors that will encourage that. The shortcomings of first past the post has been falsely attributed to PR as was eloquently speaking, and starts to fearmonger and uh, create chaos when none really exists. For the against side, we heard that first past the post requires the factions that we see in our, our political parties to work together in advance, to work out their differences within the parties. So PR, on the other hand, leads to less compromise in order to take power. Proportional representation asks, how do you identify ideologically instead of how would you like to be governed? PR is not designed then to give the voters a choice between governing agendas and between the compromises they require. And first past the post, importantly, gives you an opportunity to throw the bums out rather than get the bums that you wanted to throw out back in power. So those are some of the, in more or less polite terms, theirs was much more articulate than that, but those are some of the issues that came out. And I'm gonna start off with following up on some of those. And the first one sort of follows up on the, on the last two, on, on Chuka and Adam's uh, comments. And, and that is, we've got the evidence that the, you know, the majority of people vote for uh, a party that does not win the po I mean, the popular vote is not consistent with the party that took power. And so the examples were given from the former elections in British Columbia. 
On the other side, we hear that, well, if we add all the votes together, that's the majority of people who spoke and uh, you, know, you could get the party that you didn't want to see in power back in power. So I ask each side, how do you reconcile the other side's opinion with your proposal? I, I'm going to, okay, the rules are, raise your hand, politely. Chuka. So first, I'd like to <laughs> specify the comment that I made, and then I'll, I will respond. I did not say that votes that don't uh, determine the winner are wasted and that they're not counted. They're, they're, if they're wasted, if that's the term we're, that we're going to use, it's wasted in that they don't impact the legislature that is produced by that election. So Adam gave the example of uh, a candidate who's running in a riding who narrowly wins and ordinarily loses, and he says that they'll have to take into that, take that into their political calculation in the next election. That may be true. It's not necessarily the only way that they could intend to increase support. They could look to increase turnout. They could try to mobilize their base. There's a lot of different options. But even if that is, even if that were the case, what about every safe riding where the candidate has no, uh, no encouragement, no incentive to pursue further support, to try to reach a broader base of, of uh, the citizens or voters who live in that riding? So I think that the example shows that in perhaps in these very specific and you know not altogether common instances, it's re it's like or it's possible that a uh, uh, candidate's political calculation will include the voters who didn't support them. But again, it's only possible and only in particular in very, very specific circumstances. Um, so that's the that's, primary that, that's good. Okay, on, on, on the other side, how do you answer that one, Adam? So a couple of points. First of all, on the, the, the notion of safe seats, which we hear often from the PR side of debates like this, I mean, tell that to all but two of the NDP MLAs who ran in the 2001 provincial election here in British Columbia, many of them in so-called safe seats. The virtue of first past the post is that because the threshold for getting elected is lower, it becomes easier for voters in a particular riding to fire their MLA if they don't like them at the end of a term in government. So safe seats have a way of becoming unsafe seats very quickly. There used to be no safe seats for the Green Party, federally or provincially. Now there are more every election cycle. So this thing, this concept of safe seats being a, a trump that, that, that first past the post can't accommodate is with respect misguided. The other point to make is that Again, when you have a government that takes office, even if it is formed by MLAs who represent more than 50% of the popular vote, the decisions that that government makes are not going to be supported by more than 50% of the, po of the population over the term of that government's time in office. No government can ever enjoy majority support for most of its decisions. And that is especially true when you have parties that are coalescing into a government that disagree about important things, that have had to make trade-offs in order to agree on the terms of their coalition government. So if, for example, in BC right now, you have a, a Green Party and a, an NDP that are, that are sharing power, there are decisions that that government makes that more than 50% of the population won't support because the Greens will hate them. Or there'll be other decisions that more than 50% because a lot of liberals support them. The point is that you should know at the beginning of a government's mandate what that government has a mandate to do. You never get that in proportional representation because that choice is not offered to you when you vote. It's in, in proportional representation, it's cooked up after the fact in a back room somewhere. Uh, Any, a rebuttal? Yes, mm -hmm. an immediate rebuttal. Notice, I said Tillman and Anton do this, we're getting to see it here. Proportional representation is being denounced on the basis of a government that First Past the Post just produced. First Past the Post gave you an NDP Green coalition government, right? And that I want to challenge the other side on. They've made, what they're really arguing in favor of is single party governments, something no electoral system is capable of guaranteeing. So they have implied that first past the post um, delivers only majority governments. And yet, just on 45% of the last 20 Canadian governments were minority governments. So that's patently false. First past the post gives the party that wins the popular vote a majority government. No, it doesn't. The 1996 election in BC was won by the party that came second, an incumbent party that 4% of the population had changed their vote in order to throw out. And finally, the idea is that what First Past the Post prevents is political parties getting elected and then entering into bilateral or multilateral negotiations to determine what their government will do. 
like the government that first passed the post just gave us. Now, if these guys were arguing in favor of a voting system that had been designed to only deliver power to one party, their arguments would hold water. But they are representing first past the post as, do, as having a set of properties that the system does not possess. Whoa. And so we cannot accept an argument on that basis. Keep it down, you get your chance later. <laughs> what do you say to that? We gave the audience the impression that we were suggesting that first past the post guarantees majority governments. Then I apologize. I think that we are. I think it's pretty widely accepted. I don't. I think it's kind of not contested that first past the post is far more likely to deliver majority governments. Yes. Far more likely, I would say. This is all. All of these things with electoral systems are, are games of degrees and inches, and nothing is absolute. So yes, the first past the post system is more likely to deliver on the virtues that we advanced in our, in our submissions. Um, as for the issue of second place parties, second place in the popular vote parties forming, forming a government, I mean, second place in the popular vote, but carrying a plurality in enough, ri in enough writings that we can't ignore the fact that, you know, part of the, part of the appeal and part of what, what we're looking for and what we're suggesting as a virtue is the, the imperative to appeal to a broad plurality of voters in a plurality of writings. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to... Yeah, may I respond to that quickly? Very quickly. Okay. okay. So I don't know that it's the, the imperative to appeal to a broad plurality of voters in a plurality of writings. It's just the imperative to appeal to enough people in enough writings to give you a majority government. There's, if we're being very cynically strategic, there's no incentive for a, a candidate or a party to pursue more than that because there's no more power than, that they get for doing so. Okay, let's move on to one of the issues that has been debated, uh, and I'd like to hear both sides. One is, uh, well, we just had an election in Vancouver with, I don't know, 450 candidates. Um, I'm exaggerating slightly, um, but the, uh, you know, one of the, the critiques was, oh my gosh, A, it's taking me too long to vote, B, how do I understand who all these people are? What do we say to the argument that the anti-side has said that PR is complex? And we're not going to have the tutorial on what the three systems mean because we decided not to. But let's have the generic, you know, the, you know it is hard. How, how do we get people to deal with hard? I think people hard? need to distinguish between two key things, the ease of casting a ballot and the ease of counting the ballots. <laughs> the way the no side projects its ideas the idea is that somehow at the end of the election, we all get together and count the ballots together, and so we'd all better know how to count them. If you don't know how to count the ballots and you're riding in your own garage, how can you possibly work under this system? The point of PR stand? is to make things simple for the end user. If you're voting under first past the post, and you're trying to figure out whether to vote NDP or Green or Liberal or Tory or whatever the party is, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta figure out, okay, who's in first place in my writing and who's in second place? And okay, the national polls say these people are in first place and these people are in second, but that not, might not be true in the regional polls. What if there isn't a regional poll for my writing? How can I know if I'm moving my vote from the first place person to the third place person to try and stop the second place person? People have to do a tremendous amount of work tracking public opinion of their neighbors in order to cast effective votes. In proportional representation, you don't need to track the public opinion of your neighbors in order to cast an effective vote. So the complexity of the system is passed on to the vote counters and is reduced for the voters. Okay, how do you respond to that? We have a couple of responses, so we're gonna flip Tag it up. Tag team, okay. Yep. Uh, our first response is that purely as a matter of it's too complex for voters, uh, we don't think it's a very good argument either, which is why we didn't make it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, with respect to, to the idea of strategic voting, which is an argument that's often advanced in PR's favor, go to Germany and ask people if they don't vote strategically. In a PR system, when you know that Angela Merkel is going to be the chancellor after the election, the choice is who do you want her coalition partner to be? So in a PR system, every single election, in every system where PR exists, people sometimes vote for smaller parties because they care about the makeup of the governing coalition after the election. The idea that 
people vote only for the party that they truly believe in, even in a PR system, is frankly fantasy. But that is the, the question that the ballot asks people in a PR system. So to Chuka's point about how in a first past the post system, you don't need to appeal to a broad base of voters. You just need enough people in enough writings to give you a, to a majority. Even if that's true, we say that's preferable to a situation where after an election, you just need to appeal to enough politicians in enough other political parties to give you a majority of the legislature. If what we care about is representing the will of the people, surely the people that are in those seats should be there because enough people in enough places like the governing agenda they put forward, the compromises they said they were prepared to make. Well, that isn't really the case. If enough pe that the people who end up in the seats were sent there by people who like their governing agenda, like we talked about uh, Gary Holman, of the, the, the 64 uh, Canada, the 64 citizens in that riding who voted against him, did, is the agenda that he set forward reflected in his having a seat in the legislature? Or is the, the, the agenda that he sets forward, does it reflect the will of the people who voted against him in his riding when he goes to the legislature? Well, he got more. I think there's a, also a specific inaccuracy that's being put forward, and that is that people vote directly for parties under PR systems. So let's suppose we get the RUP system here. We're in downtown Vancouver. You know perfectly well people will be voting in a ballot where every vote is associated with a local candidate and not with a party. It's up for grabs whether people vote directly for parties based on what flavor of PR they pick. So I think it's very important to not assert a universal property to PR that one of the systems we get to choose um, actively works against. So with respect to the rural-urban proportional system that, that Stuart mentioned, it is true that there, are, there is a single transferable vote factor that applies in rural and, or, or excuse me, in urban and semi-urban ridings and a mixed member system that applies in the rest of the province. The point remains that in order to achieve proportionality across the legislature at the end of an election, you have to look at what parties people voted for, and it's that choice of party that ends up composing the legislature, not the choice of individuals in the people in a particular riding, even in an urban district. So if we're looking at outcomes, to take Chuka's word, what the outcome of a PR election is, is a legislature that reflects people's preferences of party. And again, if the parties are campaigning on an ideological footing rather than a governing agenda footing, that gives a different mandate to those individual MLAs. And the work of forming a governing majority in the legislature is left to those secret negotiations that we've mentioned a couple of times now. 83% of Canadians currently choose who to vote for based solely on party affiliation. So the idea that the votes that are filling our legislature with the most whipped, controlled, disciplined parties in the civilized world are not about a top-down party vote with one member closed lists in every riding is to attribute to our current iteration of First Past the Post properties the system might once have had centuries ago but has long since lost. So two, two quick points. The, even if we accept that people vote on the basis of party, it's what those parties go to the voters with and what they offer that determines that vote. So if the Liberal Party says, we are ideologically liberal, we are pure, vote for us because you are a liberal ideologue, that's a very different proposition than people voting liberal because there have been compromises worked out before the Liberal platform goes to the voters. It's that distinction that reflects the difference between PR and first past the post. And the question for you tonight is which of those better reflects the will of the people. Right, and okay. we all know that the 47% of Americans who voted for Republican voted for a par platform that's all based on compromise <laughs> and moderation. And I feel I, I should One ask... One more, um, and then I'm changing okay. the topic. So you've, you've mentioned this a, a few times, Adam. So what evidence do you have that uh, parties are, and candidates that are campaigning under PR use primarily ideological appeals, and parties and candidates that are campaigning under First Past the Post use primarily policy appeals? And don't please don't say, I've worked on Parliament Hill, and trust me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't going to. I, I think... <laughs> You, you just look at where PR elections are held and how parties campaign in those places and the, the voting behavior that PR is supposed to reflect and represent. If you campaign in some broad, mushy middle way that appeals to a broad coalition of voters but doesn't give you a broad base of support, you're not going to elect members of a legislature under a PR system. In fact, the complaint of people against First Past the Post is that it forces people to compromise and you don't get to vote for the party you truly agree with because you have to vote for these broad compromises. Well, if that's not the case, as you've just suggested, then the argument against First Past the Post goes out the window. 
There's a distinction between compromising and trying to keep people you vigorously oppose from, from uh, taking power. Okay, moving on. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, we clearly have different views here, which is exactly what we were intending to do and air them in this way. Let's go on to the, to the issue of voter engagement and voter turnout. We've talked a bit about engagement. Of course, the pro side is saying more engaged, and the, the, the non-pro side, the against side, is saying not clear what they're engaged for. Uh, but let's talk about voter turnout. Would you like to start? Sure, yes. OK, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just think they, they had the last word, so I'm trying to keep it fair. So my, my thinking on, on this is that the reason that likely to see less apathy and more turnout and more engagement under proportional representation is not actually necessarily reflective. It's not a good, it's not necessarily for a good reason. Mm -hmm. I say that, as I said in my opening remarks, proportional representation lets people use their votes as a form of political expression. Of course it's more appealing to go to the ballot box and mark your X beside a party that really, really you feel is going to be in the legislature working hard for your values. That feels great. I'm sure that it does. It feels much less appealing when you're faced with three milk toast platforms, none of which you really fully agree with. It's, you feel like you're choosing the, be the best of three not great options. That's politics. The hard work of politics is happening when you have to make tough choices and you're not going to get everything that you want. So yes, a, a proportional representation system, when you have multiple parties that distill the essence of an ideological uh, values or political values, a set of political preferences distilled into its, in its purest, purest form, and someone can always see their own set of preferences reflected in the legislature, perhaps that's a good thing, but it comes at a cost. And the cost is not forcing people and requiring people to really do the hard work of politics. It simply relocates the most difficult aspects of politics, the part that requires trade-offs, the part that requires deciding how you're actually gonna rank your priorities as opposed to saying we want, we want all of these things. It moves that, PR moves that from the hands of the voters to the hands of the, ML, the MLAs. Okay. It's, um, it's, a, it's a fairly infantilizing description of voters you've just heard. Um, the idea that voters are mainly motivated by instant gratification, that they're not hardworking, that they um, aren't deeply anxious when they go to vote, that they, they aren't um, uh, really burdened by the experience. And the idea, anytime it's suggested that too many people voting is a danger, I, I think we should, be, we should be very concerned about where that's heading. Okay, There's an intrinsic value in participation in politics, irrespective of outcome, one that allows us to enact our citizenship and participate in governing ourselves. I, I, I got to give it to, to there. I think you did mishear a bit what the opposition said. Yes, thank you. I spoke very carefully. Um, I did not mean to imply that voter turnout is a bad thing. I simply meant to imply that we should be we should be favoring uh, an electoral system that makes people really uh, come to terms with the, with the trade-offs that are inherent in politics. May I respond to that quickly? Very quickly. Uh, so we if have, we look we, at the... We're running out. Uh, I believe that the, the notion that compromise is good, I, I won't you know, necessarily decry that entirely, but first past the post tends to entrench two particularly powerful parties. So if you look at the 2016 election in the US, who was doing the hard work of politics there? One party said that the other was an existential threat to the country, and the other party said the same thing. I don't think that you know, they have a, a, um, a non-proportional system, they have a first festival system, so why is it that in that instance there wasn't the hard work of politics that required compromise making initially? And why is it that, the, why is it that there were so many voters in the America who didn't vote, who didn't choose either candidate? May I answer that question? Yes, you may. So the answer to it is, yeah, politics, first of all, politics in the United States is politics in the United States. British Columbia is not the United States, and if it first past the post were going to make us so, it would have done so a long time ago. The advantage of the way the, United, the American system works, and as just described by, by Chuka, 
is at the end of the day, someone's got to run the government, Republican or Democrat. If there was proportional representation in the US model, the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party would have different candidates than the Hillary Clinton wing of the Democratic Party or the Nancy Pelosi wing or however you want to describe it. And those people would run on different platforms, make different commitments, and sure, voters would get to choose which they truly agreed with. But then they'd have to go into the back room and assuming they got the most votes so they could form a majority in the legislature, they'd have to figure out what the compromises were going to be and then go to the voters and say, well, we went back in secret and we came up with this plan. Here it is. This is what you get for the next four years. People would be outraged because at least in the current system, people who vote Democratic, even if they don't like the tone of politics and even if they don't like the trade-offs that the left has made to appease the center and the center has made to appease the left, at least they know what those trade-offs are before they cast their ballot. And then at the end of four years, if they don't like the way things played out or people didn't keep their promises, they can look at that party and say the Democrats were in charge, we're going to blame them, not some coalition partner, and they can't point fingers at one another, and we're going to vote the bums out. You don't get that under PR. So the advantage of consolidating voter preference into broad-based parties isn't perfect. Huge trade-offs. Does it better reflect the will of the people? We say yes. I think it's time for the questions from the audience. Thank you, thank you, pro and against for your almost civil. I mean, it slipped a little bit from time to time, but we're not gonna let that go on. Okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to read the handwriting here and pick the ones I like the best. <laughs> Okay, well, I like that. This is, a, this is a good one. This ought to generate some discussion. Online question. If someone tried to pass a law with only 39% of MLAs in the legislature, there would be riots. So why is it okay when politicians with 39% of the vote do likewise? So if the test is whether more than 50% of people like a particular law in order for that law to be democratically legitimate, everything would have to go to a referendum. If you intend to have a representative form of government, that trade-off is made for you. It is equally made for you in a first-past-the-post system. Again, consider the example of Germany, where you had parties forming the government representing 70% of the voters, and less than 30% of people liked that they were the government, and less than 30% of the people are going to like some of those policies. I don't see how that's more legitimate, and it's certainly not more representative of the will of the people. The Polling data for public support for a government after that government has been in office and, and taken actions, actions that respond to a global context, of course, doesn't necessarily indicate how those people felt the day they've cast those, those votes. And second, if you want more than 50%, if you want to have a, a sort of sort of nebulous or fair system or means of determining if a uh, law that's going to be produced by a legislature is uh, popular, is, is popular enough to have majority support, then yes, you could have referendums for everything or you could have a proportionally representative system so that the people's uh, particular preferences are rep represented in the legislature by the people who will be voting on the law. So why not just do polls? Why not have Angus Reid make a representative sample of British Columbians and put policies to them and have the results be binding? That'd be in much because more Because I mean, the act of voting matters because that's part of our performing our citizenship. We don't just vote because of the outcome, we vote because the process has value. That going somewhere and articulating your preference as a citizen, it's a patriotic act, it's a ritual act, and that's why we want to create incentives for people to engage in that act, because other aspects of citizenship start slipping away when people's enthusiasm for participating as voters begins to flag. Let me ask a question nobody asks. Suppose we had mandatory voting. I'd be fine with that. Sounds good. I think, I, uh, I think mandatory Would voting Would that change your belief about what kind of system we need? That's I, yeah, part two. I think mandatory voting is a, a, a good idea, a compelling idea. I think that it would also necessitate that we make sure that we, that we empower people to use that vote meaningfully, which means providing them rigorous education, both on particular policies and overall having a rigorous, rigorously funded public education system. It means health care and child care and things that will allow them to take the time to inform themselves on policies and candidates and the time to vote. It has a much, I think that, you know, mandatory voting as a concept is, is good, but the implications of it, if we want to actually extend, extend the democratic franchise meaningfully to everyone, it demands a lot more of us. Let us not 
use coercion when incentives are sufficient. Let's try making election days national holidays when nobody has to work first. If that's an insufficient mechanism, maybe we can look at force after that. Do you think it was? I'm all in favor of more holidays. <laughs> I don't know that that's going to get them out to vote. It depends on what time of year it is. They may we'll all be at see. the beach. They will be at the beach. Uh, I was just, I was just saying, I think we maybe veered a little off topic, but I think everyone agrees that voting is a good thing and a civic duty and all of the all of the wonderful things that have been said. The difference between a, we say when you when you boil it all away, and sure that these are idealized notions of the two systems because that's how you get at the underlying principles. We say the difference between voting under a PR system and voting under a first past the post system just goes, just comes down to, among other things, what you are doing when you vote, what you are using your vote for. If you're using your vote to express your preferences or using your vote to make a choice about how governing is actually going to happen. Yeah, voter turnout has just been declining. So the question is, what's the cause? I mean, is it the voting system or is it other factors? Okay, online question. How will coalition governments formed under PR be able to make unpopular decisions like, oh, raising taxes or dealing with, uh, you know, significant downturns in the economy, which requires some tightening the of the belt, or making intra-allocation decisions amongst ministries? I'll give that to the PR group first. Well, um, th because First Past the Post delivers a lot of minority governments, um, we can watch ours. Um, I believe Andrew Wilkinson's ads are all about the number of taxes this government has raised. Uh, if uh, raising taxes or doing controversial things were hard for coalition governments, um, Andrew Wilkinson would be having a rougher time coming up with talking points for attacking the Green NDP coalition that's running this place now. Any comment from? Yeah. So. Ask people who voted for the NDP in the last, so first of all, because we've heard this from Stewart a lot, the suggestion that because BC, in, in BC, first past the post, produced an outcome that 100% of elections under a proportional representation produce by design, that is an indictment of first past the post, is with respect not persuasive. The British Columbia current, the current situation in British Columbia is an outlier. It's never happened in British Columbia's history before. The fact that there have been minority governments federally in the last couple of decades in Ottawa is not evidence that the, P, the first past the post system produces those kinds of results by design the way the proportional representation system does. But let's take British Columbia. Ask NDP voters who are members of trade unions, whose jobs depend on the energy sector, who voted for John Horgan, how they feel about the trade-offs that John Horgan made after the election without consulting them, without their permission, without putting it to them before the election with respect to pipeline infrastructure construction. They're not happy, and they shouldn't be happy, because this was a surprise that came up after the election because of a secret uh, negotiation that produced a coalition agreement. Likewise, ask Green voters how they feel about Site C. This is the norm in PR systems around the world. It has to happen in order for PR systems to govern. And so in the first past the post system, yeah, now and again we get governments like the one we have in BC now. But if you like that, then okay, vote for PR. The point is that none of the people who elected the the current government in British Columbia voted for, at least they went to the polls and they knew what the trade-offs that their parties were gonna make were supposed to be. If the parties subsequently make different trade-offs than those, then the parties can be held accountable. It's when the parties don't disclose what trade-offs they're prepared, prepared to make in advance that you have a problem with representing the will of the people. And that is what PR does. Uh, excuse me, there are two very quick points of information. First of all, our first minority government in British Columbia was over a hundred years ago. It was a coalition between the Tories and the Socialists in 1909, and it gave us the 40-hour work week. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, there's nothing in the confidence and supply agreement that wasn't in the NDP platform. Adam's suggesting that um, Kinder Morgan, the NDP, ran in favor of it. The NDP ran opposed to it. The confidence and supply agreement merely guarantees the NDP fulfill its promises. Also, very quickly, uh, coalition governments under first past the post are fundamentally different than coalition governments, governments under proportional representation. Under first past the post, a very small shift in popular support can mean enough riding swing that there's an incentive for opposing parties or a party that's smaller in the, in the legislature to, to trigger an election and then campaign for a majority. Under proportional representation, that incentive is extinguished. 
Do you want to comment on that last statement that coalition governments are different under the different voting rules? Yeah, let me, let, let's talk about two examples. So uh, Chuka is right that the incentives for parties are different in a, co in a PR system than a first-past-the-post system. In a PR system, a party in a coalition government has a strong incentive to point the finger at the other party in government at the end of their term and say, you don't like what we did, well, that was the, the NDP, that was the Greens, and that's gonna happen in BC in the next provincial election, just you watch. And that happens in every election in PR systems, and that is why you don't get government turnover the way that you do in a first-past-the-post system in a PR system. In Italy, in the 50 years after the Second World War, there were 47 different governments each of them was led by the Christian Democratic Party. So you get 47 changes of government, the same guys remain in charge. Why? Because they were able to say, it's not us, it's our coalition partners. In Germany, in the 50 years after the Second World War, West Germany, I should say, not a single government lost power because of an election. They lost power because their coalition partners withdrew their support after a certain period of time and decided to form a coalition with another party in the legislature. In 50 years, in other words, West Germany replaced as many governments by elections as East Germany did. If that, you think, is a better representation of the will of the people, then I suggest you have an issue with defining what the will of the people actually is. Adam said that British Columbia is not the United States, nor is it a post-World War II Axis power. <laughs> Do you, have a, on do, you have a, do you have a better here? example? I mean, the, <laughs> these are, here? Germany, is the, okay. Germany is the example that PR advocates always rely on when they're not relying on Sweden, which hasn't had a government since its election in September. None and of us mentioned either. Okay, let's keep it civil. And while we're talking about happiness, um, <laughs> isn't it, this is a question, I'm not making this up. I'm not getting you off track, this is a question. Aren't people just unhappy and miserable and cranky, no matter what system we have? I mean, no. this, is, this is the question. I'm not, I'm, this is the question. Well, you know, the no side stated if you polled the electorate, voters might be unhappy. Uh, but can't that happen anyhow? I mean, is there a system that's guaranteed to make people less unhappy? Mm, we can't course. make them happy. Um, nothing's going to stop us being British Columbians. <laughs> Uh, and uh, that's why I think it's better to move to a system where people can more constructively articulate their rage. Because uh, this is a populist jurisdiction, and uh, we want to make sure that um, that rage is articulated in the context of civil society and not elsewhere. I think that... Um Oh, oh, sorry. Did let, let, let's yeah. let them jump in and then I'll get to you. Yeah, I think if you want to see rage, go to a system where an unpopular government loses office and then doesn't lose office. That's what makes people mad. In any system, the, the questioner is absolutely correct. There are decisions that any government elected under any system will make that will annoy, piss off the majority, and many times an overwhelming majority, of voters. Look at the former liberal government in BC when it introduced the HST. People thought they were gonna lose office for it. People were furious. And if people had actually wanted to ditch that government because of that policy decision, they had an opportunity to do so. And if they'd taken that opportunity, that government would have lost office. Wouldn't have happened under a PR system. Look at Ontario. People were annoyed as hell at what the former liberal government had done in 15 years. They wanted to see the back of Kathleen Wynne. They got to see the back of Kathleen Wynne. Can you imagine the rage if she was still a cabinet minister? So here's a completely different question, and I think an important one for British Columbians. How will proportional representation better represent the interests of First Nations and other important communities who have been underrepresented in the government and the legislature? I'll take it to the pro side first. Uh, I think that depends specifically on the system that's used. Uh, uh, a compelling example is New Zealand. However, New Zealand had uh, the, I think the sort of ideological landscape is it's different the, as the parties are spread across it. And there were particular, uh, there was a quota, a minimum representation quota for the Maori people in New Zealand. So I think that really comes down to the particular system that's used and how it's implemented. Uh, we, I agree with that, and Chuka's right. In, in New Zealand, which is the example that's commonly used, you, you'll read about it in the press, is look, they had increased indigenous representation. They did have a quota system, and, they, and that is what explains that difference. If you want to have First Nations communities in British Columbia have seats in the legislature, have electoral districts where those First Nations communities can elect representatives because they take up a large enough share of the electorate and don't make the threshold for electing someone so high that that First Nations dominated but perhaps not majority district returns white folks 
to the legislature in Victoria. That's why you see Indigenous representatives under first past the post from districts, from ridings, where there are a lot of Indigenous people. Well, actually, we, um, it depends, again, on the system. But the reality is that in a region like Northern British Columbia, where First Nations do not comprise a majority in any riding, but comprise a fifth of the population, um, at least two of the systems on your ballot would make sure that um, if they chose to run a First Nations party in that region, they would meet that threshold and wouldn't just be able to enter the legislature as First Nations members of the NDP or Liberals, but if they chose to create a party that spoke for the interests of First Nations people, it would have a shot at, um, at electoral success. But aren't, Unlike aren't small, the aren't small failed regional First Nations parties uh, that uh, people tried to create in Saskatchewan and Manitoba precisely because those communities didn't feel they were being represented by the mainstream parties. Stuart, the I APPs thought, I thought in both of those provinces I, I thought, failed, but could I'm have sorry. succeeded with a regional model. I'm sorry, sorry to keep jumping in there. I, 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 I just I have to ask, you spent half of your opening remarks telling us about the evils of small regional parties. So how is this, I mean, we like the, this particular party's uh, What I said was ideology. the evils of over-representing small regional parties, giving them more seats than their share of the vote warrants. But, but then and you're that looking... is what the DUP and Bloc Québécois have received. They've received more seats, a larger proportion of the seats in the Commons than the share of the vote they received at the polls. There's no way to stop regional parties coming into being, but we shouldn't have a system that gives them incentives and magnifies their vote. No, but Stuart, they you're, you're changing the representation you're changing their, votes, the piece. their votes correspond to but, and no more. Sorry, it's just, you can't change the denominator. If you look at the districts, the regions in which regional parties get elected, they aren't overrepresented. Um, uh, if look, you look at the the, we know Northern that the Ireland. Bloc Québécois got. We it's, know that the Bloc Québécois got 17 percent of the seats in Parliament with 13 percent of the popular vote what in their first in Quebec, voting, though? and they continued performances like that. But they got more than 50 percent in more, Quebec. Uh, disproportionately. Okay, I think we've not settled that question. <laughs> um, this question is somewhat related. Do you think, I'm, I'm asking both sides, which system most incents voters uh, to vote for the smaller parties? We're talking about the tyranny of, this, of, of the voting system and, and different things, but the question actually asks, so I don't misrepresent it. Under first past the post, how is the inevitability of a two-party system of vote, uh, avoided when voters have no incentive to vote for smaller parties? Question to the uh, PR side, are there similar incentives or not? I mean, again, trying to think about uh, the outcomes of the election. So I think my understanding is that Canada is a bit odd in the sense of having a combination of first-past-the-post and a parliamentary system. The fact that we persist with a multi-party arrangement after, after all these years is a bit strange, and it has to do with very particular dynamics. So I don't... Uh, Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, the no side stated that if you polled, oh, sorry, wrong question. No. So this is about the incentive. This is about the incentive to small parties. There this are is there why, are a few. Will we avoid the two-party system? Why do we need to? Okay. How does that's the, what an do you, so? What do we do if the two-party system doesn't accurately refl reflect uh, the preferences of a large number of citizens? Well, the the virtue of the two-party system, yeah, it, it doesn't. Of course, it doesn't. But the question is whether the voting system produces results that reflect. The will of the people. Which the fact one? that the fact that there are people who don't like the choices on offer in a two-party system or a three-party system or a four-party system, but have to hold their nose and vote for one of them, simply means that those people are making the choices that someone's going to have to make because you can't legislate everything. But they're making those choices before the election, and the will of the people is reflected in the coalition, the electoral coalition that every major party already is before it comes into the legislature. By putting those t decisions off, this is what. Aubin said earlier, by pointing the, those decisions off until after MLAs are returned, you're not making the compromises go away. You're just changing who makes them, from the people to the politicians. You want to reflect the will of the people. Why would you do that? Okay, both winner-take-all systems and proportional systems have incentives for small parties. The question is, what kind of small party do they encourage? 
Proportional systems encourage small parties that have a broadly diffuse geographic support base. A lot of people spread around a wide area. First past the post encourages small parties that are very regionally concentrated or are based on a single individual. In Australia's winner-take-all system, two of the national parties are named after guys. Uh, the last Labour government in Australia was in coalition with Bob Catter's Australia Party. Uh, so personality cults and regional parties are the kind of small party first past the post encourages. Broadly based minority viewpoint parties are the kinds of small parties proportional representation rewards. And, and we weren't going to make this point because it's, again, not the most persuasive point for first past the post. But when Stuart talks about parties that can command small minority support across a wide geographic distribution, you're including Nazis, you're including communists, extreme viewpoints that are diffuse across the whole population get in in a PR system. They don't in first past the post because even if Bob so-and-so has a great following in his district and can get himself elected to the legislature, don't work that way when you have white supremacists running across the country. The fact is, you still have those people. They're still out there in the, in the electorate. In our system, though, they have to compromise too, and they have to put enough water in their wine to vote for the Conservative Party, or the far left has to vote for the NDP, unfaithful socialists that they are. And those parties then can get a mandate to form government. So those differences get assimilated again before voting happens, as opposed to, say, what happens in countries like well, pick a country with PR, where you have small parties that reflect extreme viewpoints that do decide who forms the government. I know Israel is a tired, tired example. It's one close to my heart. It's a very good one in this case. Watch how the Netanyahu government has skewed further and further to the right. Watch what's happening in Sweden, in Norway, where far-right parties are getting toeholds in the legislature. Look at Austria. Everyone in Canada and in British Columbia thinks we just need PR, and then all of a sudden we'll be New Zealand, where there are more sheep than people. We're going to turn into Austria more quickly than we turn into New Zealand. Why? Okay, so, thank you very much. To, very yeah, quickly, yeah, okay, last so, word. Nazis, if we can say one thing about Nazis, it's that they're not fans of compromise. It's not that, the, that they disappear or that they subsume their extremist ideologies and then just participate in the electoral process. They seek to take power within the established parties. That is what is happening in Canada. It's what's happening in the US. It's what's happening in Britain. It's what's happening all over the world in the instances when those parties don't have particular representation. I, I so would yes, draw, I would like I would to be able to and name the supremacy. Okay. I, would, I would draw the example of Nazis. There are a lot of far-right extremists that are a lot shy of Nazis who hold seats and power in legislatures and PR Okay, let's, let's, let's not have any Nazis in power. <laughs> we all agree, <laughs> no Nazis. We didn't bring them up. We, we're, we're, kind of, we're kind of opposed to one that. Of, one of my former debating coaches in the, is in the audience, and as soon as she heard me evoke the Nazis, that's like how you lose a debate yeah. in high school. <laughs> it's called and argumentum I, or, or ad hitlerum. Is like, okay. It's like, did you teach me nothing? I'm all sorry. All right, let's move on. Uh, shall we give them a round of applause for their... <laughs> for their mostly respectful little bit of interrupting, which we won't hold against either side because both of them did it, but yet generally, you know, well done, well done. We're, we're, we're not going to let Janet down. Uh, but now it's time for the closing arguments. And uh, I hope. <laughs> and we're going in different order this time in the interests of fairness and equity. And Adam, you are first giving your closing argument against. And these are two minute arguments. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank Stuart and Shuka for an excellent debate. Um, I, I think that we've established tonight that we can disagree strongly and strenuously and only yell at each other a little bit, which is, which is a win in our political system. The choice before you this evening is whether or not to support a motion that has specific wording. This was Chuka's point. The question you're asked is which system best reflects the will of the people. And our point on our side of the house is that you have to find out what the will of the people actually means. The will of the people is to do something. We say it's to govern a jurisdiction. The question in the ballot box ought to be, how do you want your province, your country, whatever jurisdiction we're talking about, to be governed? What compromises are you prepared to live with in order to have accountable government 
throughout the life of that government's time in office and afterward where you have the opportunity to vote them out. Proportional representation, because it tracks ideology, because the very thing that is proportional representation's greatest strength, it lets you vote your conscience, it means you don't have to compromise, is the very same reason why after an election, proportional systems do not return legislatures that reflect baked in compromises that have already been put to voters. So we're not here to tell you that first past the post is perfect. We're not here to tell you that everyone's gonna be happy every election after a first past the post election. What we're here to tell you is that after a first past the post election, in almost every case, you get what you voted for and you knew what you, you were gonna get when you went into the ballot box. And when governments implement agendas, mandates that they've been given by the people, that's how you reflect the will of the people, not by having an opinion poll on election day and having secret negotiations determine what a government's agenda will be. So if you agree with those propositions, if you believe that the choice the people must make in an election is not just what they believe, not just how they feel, but how they wish to be governed, then first past the post is the system for you and you should join us in voting against the motion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Adam and Aubin, for the debate and for to SFU Public Square for hosting this. Um, so, which system best reflects the will of the people? Well, you're the people, so what do you want? And the fact of the matter is, you all want different things, and that's good. That is a fundamental democratic value, that we are able to facilitate people's distinct desires and meet their particular needs. I don't think that we should just wait for whenever there's an election or a referendum to figure out how we should divvy up power and share it and who should be able to determine who gets what. I think that we can have an ongoing collective process of determining these things, a pro uh, an ongoing collective process that is better facilitated and produced by a proportionally representative system. I don't think that we will ever get to the point where the entire province is happy with a particular government that is a particular majority government that has a mandate, a sp very specific mandate that they ran on. That all of the people who are dissatisfied with that government government, dissatisfied with that party, or dissatisfied with that mandate, are still British Columbians. And there, I believe there is a fundamental disconnect between the notion that this is a democratic and representative uh, political structure, and those people's needs are only met insofar as it benefits the party in power. I think that the only way to properly reflect and honor the pluralism of this society, the only way to actually represent the will of the people is through a proportionally representative system and one that facilitates collective policy making both by the coalitions the coalition parties that form government and by the people that empower those particular uh, representatives and parties to have their share of seats in the legislature thank you So as Chuka said, all voters want different things. But the reality is all voters can't have all the things that they want. So the choice is between sending someone to the, to the legislature to tell the other MLAs what you want and let the chips fall where they may, or figure out who's going to get what, put together a platform, and say, all right, all of you constituencies, all of you pluralities, we need to, we need to figure this out. So, you know, put... Every, every constituency is going to decide on a particular package of policies that, weighs, that weigh against one another. Everything has a price, and that includes electoral systems. And proportional representation, yes, it, it lets you elect politicians that more closely reflect your preferences, but it also takes away your, your option to choose between packages, of packages of, governing, of policies or governing agendas, as we've been calling them. That's what tonight's debate comes down to. Because an electoral system that does not even ask us how we want to be governed cannot reflect the will of the people. The will of the people requires the smallest possible gap between the choice that you make at the ballot box and the choices that governments make once they're in office. And no system can do this perfectly. That's why we don't have referendums on every question. So short of that, first past the post, we say, is as good as it gets. Why? Because it elects governments that have a mandate to do what they promised. And if they don't do it, it lets us hold them responsible, and it gives us the power to kick them out. Proportional representation, by contrast, decouples ballot box choices from governing choices. Yes, it lets you vote your values, but it doesn't ask which of them you're prepared to sacrifice. But you can't govern without compromising. 
The, re the real work of democratic politics requires trade-offs. From time to time, it requires, it requires us to compromise certain core values in favor of other priorities. An electoral system can't reflect the will of the people if it takes those necessary compromises out of our elections. That is what we say proportional representation does. First past the post requires, oops, I'm out of time. First past the post requires political parties to hammer out their compromises beforehand, and we say that's a good thing for all of its other flaws. <laughs> Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I want to thank my fellow debaters. Uh, I think we saw a, a really good performance coming out of uh, the no side and very different arguments than you've been hearing in the media, right? This is, we are filling a niche here and I really want to thank SFU Public Square for making this possible. I've had a pile of fun this evening. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, 1957, Canada's two-party system began to seriously destabilize. Not only was the uh, left-wing CCF merging with the uh, Canadian Labour Congress and creating the NDP, there was a party, the Social Credit Party of Canada, which not like the local ones out west, was an explicitly anti-Semitic white supremacist party led by Real Coet based on anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. They won a pile of seats and between them and the NDP, they pushed the liberal, the, they created, a, caused a minority government in 57. There was a brief break with a majority in 58. 1962, a minority government, the government fell within a year. 1963, another government fell within two years. 1965, the third minority government in a row, the liberals are two seats short. And so they entered into those sinister, secret post-election negotiations <laughs> with the Socialist Party led by T.C. Douglas. And you know what they cooked up in that back room? Medicare. <laughs> now I wanna suggest to you that what, for, what proportional representation does is it creates more possible moments like that in Canadian politics, not fewer. And I think when creative people are forced to negotiate or forced to come together against the threat of a dangerous extremist party, who knows what kind of positive solutions they can create. Well, we had the Nazi card and the Medicare card. I mean, <laughs> what do most people care about? Keeping the uh, Nazis out and Medicare in. So uh, let's do it. Well, thank you. Thank you, all, all of our debaters. That is, uh, uh, it's been, as, as all of them said, uh, an excellent opportunity to hear both pros and cons. And now it is your turn to vote yet again. You're getting good practice for, for voting. Uh, remember, please take your, uh, your uh, the, the next ballot that you have and vote and hand them to, if you're ready, when you're ready, to the uh, wonderful volunteers. Remember that the winner is those who change the most minds. So take your time, take, uh, listen to the uh, debates again, and off you go. So they're talking. I'll wait till. Thank you. Oh my God, my hands are freezing. It's freezing. I hear your hands are warm. Thanks so much. I really had a great time. Thank you, Professor. Oh yeah, Madam my pleasure, Madam Speaker. I, I, I like being a speaker. Hey. Yeah. Sure. Where would you like us, Greg? All right.
You're not allowed to leave yet. Please do not leave. You can't leave before you know the outcome. It's like going, well, you know, leaving the movie. And these are some of my students are trying to leave. But those are the graduates, so they don't have anything to worry about anymore. I'm not holding any grades over them. Don't you want to know the outcome? These are not the rolling credits. This is, this is the outcome stuff. They're tallying the outcome. I'm supposed to ask people while they're tallying. They'll, they'll be quick. This is, this is not the United States where they have to recount things 25 times. I know, they're still balloting. We're not done. See, even one of our debaters is trying to sneak out. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. So, why do you care so much about this, you people? <laughs> this well, matters. I mean, Stuart, Stuart made the point about how voting is important. This is, this is a fundamental choice that British Columbia has to make about how we're going to be governed as a province for the foreseeable future. I think now that we're out of the official debate, the, uh, the things that we agreed not to say are, are out the window. <laughs> but practically speaking, if, if the voting system changes, you're not changing back in two years because the legislature that would have to affect that change will have been composed by the PR system. So every person in it will have an incentive to keep the status quo. And that's why this matters. This choice matters. This is why the argument that we didn't make tonight, but that is made against the referendum question, that if you have 10% or 12% or 20% of the electorate by a bare majority voting to change the, 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 the electoral system, that's a big deal. So I hope that all of you go back home to wherever you're from and all of you watching online, you know, call, call your friends, call your neighbors. People need to vote because if the voting system's gonna change, let's make sure that turnout is better than you know, an, an election and that people actually can <laughs> believe that the result does reflect the will of the people. Forget the result of a, an ultimate election. This result really matters if we're going to believe in the kinds of governments we're going to have in BC. Jugan? Well, yeah. um, I mean, so at the beginning, you, you mentioned that this is my two areas of sort of uh, drug policy and inequality, and this might seem a bit tangential to that. I but, was going to ask you that, yeah. but I think um, you did tell but, us. I mean, this is, I, I would say that uh, proportional representation works against some of the, some of what I would characterize, uh, perhaps contentiously, as uh, political inequality. But in a, in a broader perspective, uh, this matters because everything matters. You know, in no uncertain terms, we are running out of time. We have very serious, critical, foundational issues in the structure of our societies, in the way that we've organized uh, our, our, you know, global, inter global interactions, and how we, how we predicate our lives on this planet. And unless we have unless we are able to develop earnest solutions to them that, satisfy, that meet people's needs but also satisfy them, that, that win their support, I mean, what hope do we have? Alvin, what, what, why are you here? So I was motivated <laughs> to participate in this debate because uh, I really think that it's important for British Columbians who are facing this decision to step back and think and remember that there is no, as I said, there's no perfect electoral system. There are only electoral systems that score higher on some democratic values and lower on others. So there's no more or less democratic system. There's, there are only systems that produce more accountability or less accountability, more representation of regions or, or more representation of ideas, as Stuart was saying, more political expression, better or worse deliberation. These are the kinds of, of metrics that political scientists use to think about uh, electoral systems. And it's important, I think, for people who are looking at this decision to think about which of those democratic values they care about the most and try to understand how that's going to play out under a different electoral system. Thank you. First one of these. First one of these I did, I was 19 years old, it was 1991, I debated David Schreck on proportional representation uh, at the BC Civil Liberties Association uh, all candidates meeting when I was running for the Green Party in Vancouver Fraser View. Um, so really I'm a cautionary tale. Um, <laughs> Electoral reform could take over your life, uh, wreck your career, um, lead you to a, into a series of increasingly uh, fruitless uh, referendum campaigns. But um, uh, one of the things I, I want to do here is to um, uh, say that um, 
you know, it's very likely a postal vote is heavily skewed in favor of the oldest, richest, most rural, and whitest British Columbians. There are all kinds of other ways this vote well, is being used by this government to whip up its base, but is not a sincere attempt to win. And what I want to do is make sure that people um, consider being part of the long haul for democracy in this province. Win or lose, proportional representation is a principle that is linked to an understanding of human rights and human equality. And so this isn't just about one vote. I urge you to become part of the movement for fairer voting systems at all political levels. Whatever happens at the end of this month, Vancouver will be debating how to democratize its municipal system and possibly enact PR. There'll be a federal election next year, and so please stay in this. Don't check out on November 30th. I, I think you've heard that both, uh, both for and against, we have uh, representatives here of great Canadians who are passionate about the rights of people to vote and exercising that vote. Let me ask the audience a question. How many of you have voted? <laughs> Pretty good. I give you about a B minus. Uh, it's, no, no, on no. this, on the referendum. How many of you voted? How many hey, of you? Oh, is that ever? <laughs> that was terrible. How many have already voted on the referendum? Pretty good, not too good. Are all of the rest of you going to vote? Yes, yeah, all right. They're waiting to hear what we had to say. What? They're waiting to hear what we had to say, hopefully. No, no, I know, but yeah. yes, okay. That's why you came tonight to hear. Yes. Okay, all right. I, I take away the B minus. It's back to an A plus. Are we ready yet for the vote? They're still are they what are they doing up there? Got a vamp, Nancy. One more question? I have to ask him another question. What did you do today besides prepare for this? <laughs> You guys first. Yeah, uh. <laughs> None of your business. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, shall we ask the question, what do you think the outcome's going to be? Stuart's already mm -hmm. projected, so. Chuka, what do you think the outcome of the referendum? You've already voted, so we're not biasing anything. Um, I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't feel confident enough in a prediction to voice it. What a weaselly answer that <laughs> one is. <laughs> Do you want to do you want to join the? Uh, I'm too afraid to t tell you. <laughs> I I think it's probably going to fail because I had because if it's going to fail when you have the citizens assembly that's this really elaborate detailed democratic process and a huge educational effort and and it still failed. I mean I, I appreciate that the threshold was very high, but you know. Oh, I think, we, I think we got numbers. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. I'm off the hook. Oh. Final. Huh. Okay, I'm supposed to remind you. What's that up there? That's that's the ch wait, wait a minute. So the first that that's round one. Okay, just to make sure I've got too many cards here to too many numbers. Round one, sixty-two percent for, twelve percent against, twenty-six percent undecided. Da 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 drum roll. Da 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 da. Four. Sixty-two percent. They were hardcore. Against twenty-eight. Undecided ten. The change is nothing for the four side. A plus sixteen for the against side. Congratulations. Good try. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good. You came in. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Doris. Wait, wait, wait. Closing, closing. Sit down.
I will want to congratulate everyone and all of you for staying and uh, waiting through the fire alarm. I'd now like to invite uh, Maria Cecilia Saba from Van City's Office of Community Engagement to say a few closing words. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, my name is Maria Cecilia Saba. I'm the interim program coordinator at the Van City, at SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Um, our office supports creative engagement, knowledge mobilization, and public programming in the key areas of social, uh, of uh, arts and culture, social and environmental justice, and urban issues. And we do this through public talks, workshops, screenings, performances, and partnerships with community organizations. So make sure to check us out online at www.sfuwoodworks.ca. Um, we were thrilled to partner tonight with Public Square. Uh, this was a very exciting, thought-provoking event, so congratulations to all the debaters. And uh, I would like to just finish by thanking the amazing people that made tonight happen. Uh, first of all, uh, Nancy Oliweiler for moderating. I would also like to thank the debaters themselves, uh, Stuart, Adam, Chuka, and Aubin. I would like to thank Ma Mika Goldberg. Ma Mika? Mika? <laughs> Uh, our ASL interpreters, Silas and Julie. <laughs> the staff and volunteers at SFU Public Square and SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. <laughs> I would also like to thank SFU Communications and Marketing, SFU's Meeting and Event and Conference Services, Creative Studio, who is webcasting tonight's event, uh, our tech person, front of house, and usher, and last but not least, all of you for coming in, coming in tonight and sticking throughout the night, <laughs> even after that little. <laughs> Have a good night. Thank you.